Open your Bibles once again to 1 Timothy chapter 4. How many of you were here last night? Amen. How many of you were not here last night? Where were you? That's, that's none of my business, but we're glad you're here this morning. Praise God. We began sharing last night uh, the prophetic word that the Lord has given me for 2024. You say, well, it's still 2023. Yes, but I can't wait for 2024. I mean, once I hear the word, and I'm, I'm, I'm fired up and already believing for the results of it. And it's already happening, praise God. And, and I asked the Lord to do that for me so that when I take it, the word to the rest of the world, that it gives validity to it. Signs following, the Bible says. Confirming the word with signs following. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, last night we said that the Lord impressed upon me very sternly to tell the people that going into 2024, it is vital, it is important, it is mandatory that you stay in faith, stay focused on the promises of God, and do not allow anything that is happening in the world around you to distract you. I'll say it again, stay in faith, Stay focused on the promises of God and don't let anything in the world around you distract you or anything that's happening in the world around you to distract you. Distractions is one of the ways that Satan attempts to keep you from experiencing God's best. And we've all been distracted in one way or the other, but uh, it, it's, it's very serious in the hour in which we live to avoid distractions at any cost. Amen. So if you found 1 Timothy chapter 4, you notice the Apostle Paul saying to his son in the Lord Timothy, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Now I said last night that after the Lord stressed to me about how important it was for us to stay in faith, stay focused, and to avoid distractions. He said, if they'll follow those instructions, then their 2024 will be a year of progression, a year of advancement, and a year in which their highest expectations will be fulfilled. And that sounds good to me. Anybody else, praise God. Anybody interested in progressing, advancing, your highest expectations being fulfilled? Well, it doesn't happen automatically. And that's the reason Paul said to Timothy, because he'd given him some very important instructions about living this life of faith. And now he says, now meditate upon these things. In other words, think about them. Think about them day and night. That's what God told Joshua, to meditate on these things day and night so that uh, you are able to put them to work or you'll able to apply them. And then he says, and you will make your way prosperous. Or in other words, you will experience progression and you'll experience advancement. So meditate upon these things. Meditating is something I do all the time. In fact, that's the reason why most everywhere we go back home, my wife drives. Because I'm always thinking about something the Lord said or some scripture I just read and I wind up driving in circles. <laughs> she says, pull over, <laughs> let me drive. So now I don't even, I don't even, I don't even attempt to drive. I just get in the driver's seat and, and we talk a little bit, you know, and, and of course she knows her way around Fort Worth better than I do. Cause even though I have a home there, I see it very seldom. Okay. <laughs> And she knows all the best ways to go and all the, you know, all the uh, new ways. And I don't know. So it's just best to let her drive. <laughs> Amen. So I can think. <laughs> Hallelujah. I call my car my think tank. <laughs> and my airplane is a think tank. So I'm, I'm meditating all the time. I'm just thinking about what God says and how to apply it and the results that it'll produce. Amen. And then uh, he says, meditate on these things and then give yourself wholly 
not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, meaning uh, commit to them, uh, uh, dedicate yourself to them. The Bible teaches us how important it is to be more than just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Amen. So uh, give yourself wholly to these things. In other words, make a quality decision that you're not just going to listen to it, but you're going to apply it. You know, uh, the Bible talks about the sower sows the word. I'm a sower. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm sowing the word into you. And hopefully you're listening to every word I have to say. And you can hardly wait for the next sentence to come out of my mouth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So I'm a sower. I'm sowing the word. But remember what Jesus said in the fourth chapter of Mark. Once the word is sown, Satan cometh immediately. I like to say, if not sooner. <laughs> Satan cometh immediately to take away the word that was sown in their heart. So we actually have an advantage by knowing that. Because, uh, you know, you can walk right out of this building after having heard the word and, and hopefully inspiring your faith. And you can walk right out of this building and, and not get half a mile down the road. And Satan's already trying to steal what you heard. One phone call can rob you of what you heard. Amen. One negative phone call. And how many of you have relatives who feel that it is their call in life to discourage you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So you have to be very protective about what you hear. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter four that we are to guard our hearts and we guard our hearts by, by being very selective about what we see and what we hear because our eyes and our ears are the gateways to the heart. So what you see has a way of affecting what you believe. What you hear has a way of affecting what you believe. So once you hear these things this morning, then it's your responsibility to protect your heart and don't allow distractions to take away from you what God's putting in you. Can you say amen? amen. You remember last night we, we read about uh, Jesus praying for Simon and he said, uh, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And the word sift means to extract something. So uh, Satan is always trying to extract something that God has put in our hearts and we must be protective over it. I remember uh, I didn't know these things back when I first came to the Lord in 1969 and, and I'm beginning to study the word. And one day I've, I found out in the Bible that by his stripes, we are healed. That was a great revelation to me. In fact, I, I walked into a room where Carolyn was. I said, Carolyn, did you know that Jesus has already paid the price that we might live in health? She said, well, I've known that since I was eight years old. I said, then why are we getting sick? And I took her into the bathroom and I said, what is this up here on the wall? And you have one. And most people call it a medicine cabinet. I said, why do we have a medicine cabinet? And why is it full of everything the TV says we need? If you already knew, you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. Fred Price, first time I heard Fred Price, he said, the Bible says by his stripes, we are healed. And if we are healed, we were healed. And if we were healed, we is healed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so that became a great revelation to me. I mean, by stripes, I'm healed. And I thought, okay, my days of sickness and disease are over. I said that my days of sickness and disease are over. And it wasn't, it wasn't the, before the sun went down that night, I had all the symptoms of the flu. I felt like a dog. I couldn't move. I, everything hurt. I thought, well, I must have read that wrong. What's well, happening? Satan came immediately. And then I remembered what Jesus said. I said, wait a minute. 
These symptoms are Satan coming immediately to steal what I just heard about divine health. Amen. So I got up out of that bed because I remember hearing Brother Hagin say, uh, sick men, I mean healed men don't stay in bed all day. So I got up out of the bed and boy, I felt like a dog, but I took my steps of faith and every step I confessed, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed. healed. I'm redeemed from the curse of sickness and disease. By his stripes, I'm healed. And in less than an hour, every symptom was gone. And praise God, I've been living in divine health ever since. Hallelujah. So Satan is always trying to steal the word. Why? Because the word enables us to progress. Progress in health, progress in well-being, progress in prosperity. The word is designed to bring advancement and progression into our lives. And it's no wonder that Satan is out to steal it just as soon as we receive it. Amen. So notice here, once again, Paul says, meditate upon these things, give yourself wholly to them, dedicate yourself to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Notice If you will do what he says, then you will profit. Now the word profit in some other translations is progress and advance. In fact, I'll read a couple of them. We read them last night. The Amplified Bible says, your progress will be evident to everybody. Your progress will be evident to everybody. Amen. It didn't take long for people that knew me In 1969, it didn't take long for them to see the evidence that that old Jerry Savelle didn't exist anymore. I became a new creation. And this new creation is living totally different than that old one did. Amen. And and it wasn't long before people are saying, you're you're different. In fact, I I, I was in the, uh, at the time, uh, when Carol and I first married in 1966, I wanted to serve my country and uh, I had thought about enlisting in the, in the military and, and Carol and I had just married. I, w- I was in college. I was in my second year of college and, uh, and we were talking about starting a family. And so rather than go to the recruiting office and, and enlist, uh, shortly after that, a friend of mine told me, called me and said, Uh, I know you are interested in serving your country. The National Guard has an opening for about 20 men. And if you get down there to the base as quickly as you can today, it's possible that you might be selected. Well, serving in the National Guard uh, meant that uh, I had to go to training. I had to go to basic training. I had to go to AIT. I had to go to summer camp and you served for six years. But at the same time, you could be home you know, and, and work. And then they would call you up from time to time when, when something was going on. And like now, you know, when, when a battle's going on or war is going on, they, they, they call up the National Guard along with those that uh, have been recruited. And back then in 1966, when I joined, 67, uh, the civil rights movement was going on. And uh, our unit was trained by the state police for riot control. Now, while I was in basic training and when I was in AIT, uh, being raised on a farm, your grandfather, your father teaches you how to handle weapons. And I qualified expert in everything they put, my, put in my hands. And so uh, when we would go for uh, riot control, They'd put me on tall buildings as a sniper. Thank God I never had to shoot anybody. Okay. And sometimes I'd be at work and I'd get a call, be at the base at two o'clock this afternoon. Uh, We had to be where there was a riot going on. And every time there was a hurricane, we'd have to go and, uh, you know, keep people from looting. And so I never knew when I was going to get called up. Sometimes I'd be gone three days, sometimes three weeks. I mean, 
And, and you did that for six years. You committed to six years. So anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just now come to the Lord. And Kenneth Copeland sent me a set of E.W. Kenyon books and a message in there. Read these books, study them closely, and they'll make a great impact on your life. And so every time we had to go uh, somewhere uh, in the, with the National Guard, I'd take some of those books with me and I'd, I'd read them on the way and I'd read them in my bunk. And eventually guys were coming around my bunk for me to teach. In fact, uh, my, my uh, commanding officer wanted me to go to OCS and come back and be chaplain of our unit. And I said, well, that's, that would be an honor, but uh, I feel like I'm called to travel and that would restrict me because I was having more people around my bunks, bunks than they were having in the chapel services. The chapel services, they were giving them three points and a poem and most of the points out of Reader's Digest. I'm, I'm sharing the word with them. And, and they were gathered around my bunk all the time. In fact, one of the, one of the chiefest sinners of them all of course, Paul was number one. This guy was number two. And his name wasn't Jesse DePlan, so there's another guy. And uh, so anyway, uh, this guy, I mean, he was demon possessed. And he did his best to distract me. I think he felt like it was his call in life to get me to backslide. And... Uh, so, you know, before BC, before Christ, I drank with them, I gambled with them, you know, and, and they'd come to my bunk and with their alcohol and, you know, when we were off duty, don't you want to drink, Jerry? No, I don't drink anymore. Don't you want to play Bure with us? That's a game in South Louisiana. And if you ever learn how to play it, it's a very mental game and I became an expert Bure player. And you can lose everything you own in one hand. You can win everything everybody else has got in one hand. But it's a very mental game. And I got really good at it. And uh, so they'd, they'd break out the cards on my bunk while I'm reading an E.W. Kenyon book. <laughs> Don't you want to play, Jerry? Don't you just want to play one more time? Come on, play one more time. And this guy was a ringleader of it. So I set my sights on him. If I could win him to the Lord... It's quite possible I can win that whole unit. Okay. Well, one night, Carol and I are in church and uh, the pastor asked us to come down to the altar and just pray, you know, for uh, 30 minutes or so before we left the service. He'd finished his sermon. And so every, all, everybody that wanted to was gathered around the altar and, and I'm kneeled down here in front of the altar. Somebody tapped me on the back. I turned around and it's this guy. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I've been watching you all this time and you've never, you've never backed off and I can't get you out of my mind and I want what you've got. Amen. 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 So led him to the Lord that night. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit and he and I became Paul and Silas over that unit. <laughs> we won over 2,000 men to God. Just the two of us. Amen. 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 So that's one of the reasons that the word is so dangerous to the devil because the word will cause you to progress and cause you to advance in your quality of life. And when you do, somebody's going to notice it. Now that's what happened with this guy. He noticed that I was not the same and, and, and God was doing things in my life. And finally, it became an attraction to him and he wanted to know my God. And as a result of it, he and I became Paul and Silas in that unit. I mean, we won so many men to the Lord. And that's the reason my commanding officer wanted me to go to OCS and come back as the chaplain. But I knew I was called to travel and I couldn't do that. So the blessing of God on our life is designed to cause us to progress and to advance. 
The Word of God in our lives is designed to cause us to progress and to advance. No wonder Satan is out to take it from you. And once again, he does it primarily through distractions. Distractions. So you have to be very careful about what you watch and what you listen to. Your eyes and your ears, once again, are the gateways to the heart. So the Amplified Bible says, your progress will be evident to everybody. The Passion Translation says, everyone will see that you are moving forward. Amen. How many of you like moving forward? Amen. I, I like to say that's always God's direction for his people. Never regress, progress. Never go backwards, go forward. That's God's best. Now the phrase make evident in the little Greek means to spread abroad, to become widely and openly known. The word from the Amplified where it says, your progress will be evident to everybody. In the little Greek, this phrase evident to everybody means to spread abroad or to become widely and openly known. With so much adversity in the world today, and you're progressing, and you're advancing, then you will have the attention of others. Why? Because the world's screaming right now, worst of times, worst of times. But when God's people are having their best of times, amen, amen anybody having your best of times? Amen. I am. I mean, ever since 2020, when COVID hit, we, we broke all records in our ministry by the end of 2020. We went to another level. 2021, we broke all the records we broke in 2020. 2022, we broke all the records that we broke in 2021. It's almost the end of 2023 and we're on target to break all the records of 2022. Amen. I'm having my best of times. Best of times. Hallelujah. I'm progressing. I'm advancing. Amen. And it's, it's not because I'm so good. It's because God's so good. Amen. Amen. But I am smart enough to stay in faith. Amen. Give me a little credit. I am smart enough, smart enough to stay in faith, smart enough to stay focused on the promises, and smart enough to not allow anything in this world around me to distract me. Amen. One of the things that I learned in the early days of my walk with the Lord, I was reading... Uh, I, 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 I just fell in love with the ministry of the Apostle Paul. I've said many times when I get to heaven, I'm going to spend a lot of time with my, my Heavenly Father, a lot of time with my Savior Jesus Christ, and the next person I want to spend time with is the Apostle Paul. And I plan to tell him, I preached all your sermons. <laughs> and I gave you credit for it. I mean, what a, what a champion. What a hero in the faith. And I remember reading in Acts chapter 20 where Paul made this statement. He said, uh, the Holy Spirit has told me in advance that every city I go to to preach the gospel, trouble awaits me. Now, most preachers, if the Holy Spirit told them, when you go to Miami, trouble is waiting for you, they would avoid Miami like the plague. Huh? Or when you go to Dallas, bonds and afflictions will be waiting for you. They'd, they wouldn't go to Dallas. They'd go to Tulsa, you know. But Paul said this, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. I will finish my course and I will do it with joy. Amen. And I read that one day back uh, just a few months old in the Lord. And I walked in there to Carolyn and I showed her what Paul said. And I said, you mark my words, young lady. One day I'm going to be able to say that, that nothing moves me. Right. Nothing moves me. Right. Well, that didn't happen overnight, but praise God I'm there. You ask anybody that knows me well, I am not moved by the crazy things that are happening in the world. I'm focused on what God has promised. And I'm, I, I, I may be small in stature, but I got a bulldog tenacity. I don't give up until the promise is fulfilled. Amen. Amen. Now, I was not always that way. 
Before Christ, I was a quitter. I always looked for the path of least resistance. Amen. And uh, I remember when, when Carol and I first married, I, I was going to college at night and I was working on cars at dealerships during the day. I was a paid body man. I learned that from my dad. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd come home. I, my first job when Carol and I married, uh, I was working at the uh, Mercury Lincoln dealership. And we wore green uniforms, dark green slacks and a light green shirt. And here it had harder Lincoln Mercury, Jerry. I was Jerry. And every morning I'd come to breakfast. How many of you remember when wives cooked breakfast before the husband went to work? You know? <laughs> Those days are long gone. You know? <laughs> and so and Carolyn would have breakfast waiting for me and before I'd go to work. And I'd come in there with that green uniform on. And then I'd go to work and then I'd get off work, come home, take a shower and, and uh, I'd go to school at night for about four hours. And so yeah, that was my routine every day. Well, one day I came to breakfast and she said, that's a different uniform. She said, what happened to the green uniform? I said, I don't work at the Lincoln dealership anymore. I work at the Buick dealership. And it was brown slacks and a light brown shirt. Hullet Buick, Jerry. I was Jerry. <laughs> she said, why do you have a different uniform on? I said, they made me mad at the Lincoln dealership, so I quit. Now, I always had another job before dark, but Carolyn never knew where I worked based, except on the color uniform I had on. <laughs> it may be six weeks, I'd come in with a blue uniform. Well, you had on a brown uniform yesterday. Where'd you get the blue uniform? I don't work at Buick anymore. I work for Chevy Land. <laughs> Chevy Land. Jerry. I was Jerry. <laughs> the only way Carolyn could keep up with my jobs is she looked for the color of the uniform I had on. <laughs> Why? Because I was a quitter. I was a quitter. If, 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 they, if they upset me, I'd show them I'd quit. I kept the tailgate of my pickup truck open just in case I wanted to load my snap-on tool chest before work was over that day. That's just the way I lived. I was a quitter, looking for the path of least resistance. And then when I came to the Lord, the first scripture I ever read, if you continue in my word, you will be my disciple indeed. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And that little word, continue, got as big as that page on my Bible, in my eyes. It, I felt like it jumped off the page and went into my heart. And God said, that's the missing ingredient in your life. You've always been a good starter, but you've never been a good finisher. And he said, if you don't develop the art of continuing, you'll never be the man I want you to be. You'll never be the husband I want you to be. You'll never be the father I want you to be. And you'll never be the preacher I want you to be. So I made up my mind that day. Quitting is no longer an option. Amen. Quitting is no longer an option. And I developed a spiritual bulldog tenacity that none of these things move me. None of these things move me. And so I, I give all the credit to God and to his word because that's what shaped me, molded me, made me into the person I am today. And if God can do that with me, just imagine what he could do with you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So notice here that distractions are one of the ways that Satan keeps us from progressing and keeps us from advancing. So once again, the word evident in the little Greek means to spread abroad, to become widely and openly known. And once again, with there being so much adversity and, and so much uh, chaos in the world today, Satan will do everything he possibly can do to keep you from progressing and keep you from advancing. Why? Because the Bible says that we are living epistles and somebody is reading your life every day. And you may not even be aware they're doing it. I've had a lot of people over the years come up to me and, and say, how are you doing this? Where are you getting all of this? 
And I never preached one word to them. They just observed my life. Where are you getting all this? How are you doing this? And I just simply say, it's the God I serve. It's his blessing on my life. It's his favor on my life. Would you like to know my God? I've never had anybody turn me down when they came to me based on the evidence they saw. Amen. The evidence they saw. Hallelujah. So notice here, if you follow these instructions, it will be evident. Your progress will be evident. The other translation that I read, and I'll read it again from the Passion, everyone will see that you are moving forward. Moving forward. That's a great testimony to have in today's world, that you are moving forward. Look at your neighbor and say, and that is my plan. I will move forward. I will not go backwards. I will progress. I will not regress. And give the Lord a good shout for it. Praise God. Amen. Now, let's, let's take a look at something in the book of Genesis. Talking about evidence, progressing, advancing. Let's look in Genesis chapter 24. And you remember God had, had promised Abram, later changed his name to Abraham, that he would bless him. And the word bless means empowered to prosper, empowered to multiply, empowered to increase, empowered to excel, empowered to rise above what keeps everybody else down. That's what blessing means. I don't know where we got the only time we talk about blessed in a lot of households. The only time they ever hear the word blessed is when somebody sneezes. Bless you. I don't know where we got that. But the word bless means to empower to prosper, to empower to increase, to empower to multiply, to empower to excel and enable to rise above what keeps others down. That's what it means to bless. And God promised that he would bless Abram and his seed. Now in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 35, look at this. One of uh, Abraham's servants made this statement. The Lord had blessed my master greatly and he has become great he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold. Notice that's one of Abraham's servants talking. What are they saying? There's evidence that God has blessed my master because he's increased in herds and flocks and in silver and in gold. In other words, there was evidence. He, Abraham went just going around saying, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. There was evidence he was blessed. Because increase was taking place in his life. He increased in flocks and herds. He increased in silver and gold. Genesis chapter 24 verse 1 says that by the time Abraham was an old man, God had blessed him in all things. Another translation says in every way. And there was evidence of it. Has anybody noticed you're blessed? Try this side. Has anyone noticed that the blessing of God is on your life? Yes. They should. Yes. If the blessing is on your life and you know how to operate in it, then somebody should be recognizing it. Amen. They should be noticing it. In fact, they should be envious of you. Amen. Amen. You know, People that criticize you for being blessed. T.L. Osborne taught me this years ago. He said, when people criticize you from being blessed, it's their carnal way of saying, I wish I was you. It's jealousy. It's jealousy. Amen. Well, just keep making them jealous. <laughs> just keep living blessed. Amen. Praise God. So notice here, when the blessing is on your life and you know how to operate in it, then there's going to be evidence. 
And Abraham's master said uh, to someone else that my master has been greatly blessed and he's increased in flocks and herds and silver and gold. Now, look at Genesis chapter 26, talking about Isaac. Remember the blessing was for Abraham and his seed. And Isaac is the seed of Abraham. But here's the best part of the whole story. Galatians chapter three says, we are the seed of Abraham and we are heirs according to the promise. Look at your neighbor and say, how does it feel sitting next to the seed of Abraham? <laughs> Hallelujah. Go ahead and lean up next to him and say, go ahead and touch me. It'll be all right. <laughs> huh? You're the seed of Abraham and you're entitled to every blessing that Abraham enjoyed. It should be said of you. Now I'll be 77 soon. Okay. And that's not old. It's just getting older. Now, when I was 27, 77 was old, but it's not old anymore. Okay. And uh, I'm one of these strange people. My, my wife says I'm weird. I look forward to getting older. I really do. I look forward to getting older. She says, you have a birthday and you're already talking about next year's birthday. I said, yeah. She said, you're a nut. Why don't you just enjoy this birthday and wait till your next birthday to talk about it? I said, I can't wait. <laughs> she said, why do you love getting older? I said, because of the promises of God for older people. And most old people haven't even read them. I was reading they sat around in a rocking chair just waiting to die. <laughs> I'm not sitting around in a rocking chair waiting to die. And retire is not in my thinking. No, I'm not, I don't have any, in, in, uh, any desire to retire. You know, I graduated from high school in 1964. And, and every year, they want me to come back and address the students. I've only got to go one time, my 20 year reunion. And uh, that's the only time I've got to go. And I, that's a long time ago. And every year they send me a little book of, of uh, all the graduates in 1964 in this particular high school that they've located and what they're doing now. And I always look forward to looking that that book. They wanted me to come this year back in April, but I was, I was out of the country and I couldn't come. And, uh, they, they honored me on my 20 year anniversary or, or home. What was it? Uh, reunion, high school reunion for being the only graduate in 1964 from this high school who had worldwide recognition. Amen. The next, uh, two years later, that honor was given to someone you might've heard of, Terry Bradshaw. And my wife graduated with Terry. She went to school with Terry from sixth grade all the way to graduation. I was two years older than Terry. We knew each other, but not real well. Uh, he, he was a quarterback on the football team. I played baseball. And uh, so uh, every year they want me to come back and, and address the students. And I, I very seldom get, well, I've never got to go back since my 20 year reunion because I'm always gone. But I, I look forward to getting that little book. And when I open it up and, and begin to reminisce and remember the names of certain people that I was real close to in high school, uh, it's amazing to me how many times I see the word deceased. Deceased. One of my very close friends. Oh, it, it just got me. His name was Larry Alexander. And Larry and I were extremely close friends. And when I saw his name, deceased. Oh man, it just touched my heart. It, and uh, uh, another guy I was very close to. We used to go to the drag races together. And his name was uh, uh, Richard McFarlane. We all called him Dickie McFarlane. And Dickie died. And then either deceased or retired. Deceased or retired. Very few of them are still working. They're old. <laughs> 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 
They're either deceased or retired. Do I look like I'm ready for the grave? And I, 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 had, I have no desire to retire. As I said last night, I heard 1969, go ye, and I haven't heard stop ye yet. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And not only that, but traveling like I do and all over the world and meeting wonderful people like you all over the world, Amen. it keeps you motivated. Yes. I've noticed, yes. I've noticed when people, now not everybody, but many people, when they quit having something that wakes them up in the morning and gives them drive during the day, they start dying. When people stop dreaming, they start dying. Well, I'm a dreamer. I still got big dreams. And when they're fulfilled, I'm going to dream bigger dreams. That's what keeps me young. In fact, uh, one of my grandsons, I'd never heard this phrase. They got new phrases now, you know. Back in my day, it was cool. You cool. Now, my grandson says, my grandson says, Papa, you're the drip. I said, what's the drip? Or you have drip. Now, what does that mean, Eric? Appeal. Swag. Cool. My grandsons think I'm cool. In fact, when I'm away, they raid my closet because they want my clothes. They want my shoes. I tell them, if you ever get past size nine, you're on your own. If you stay size nine, you have a lot of shoes you can wear, praise God. You know? A lot of clothes you can wear. Amen. And, and every once in a while, I'll just go through the closet and when I know they're coming and I'll just lay them out in the den and I'll say, go for it. Pick out what, what you want. They've never said, that looks like an old man's clothes. I don't wear old man's clothes. I'm cool. I got swag. <laughs> I got the drip. <laughs> Hallelujah. So why do I look forward to getting older? I'm glad you asked. Go to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Look at verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. When? In old age. Now the word fat does not mean overweight. I look overweight. Fat in the little Hebrew means prospering. Amen. They will be prospering and they will be flourishing in old age. So that's the reason why, you know, I'll be 77 before long. And, and the next week I'll be talking about, I'm looking forward to being 78. Brother Copeland is exactly 10 years older than me. He's 86. In December, he'll be 87. He says he's going to live to be 120. And now he's saying, and Jerry's going to live to be 110 because I'm 10 years older than him. And when I leave, there's no need Jerry hanging around. He's going with me, praise God. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've been preaching together for 53 of my 54 years. Okay. And we're not done yet, praise God. Amen. So notice here, I, I call flourishing advancing. Uh, progressing. And, and another translation says this, they, they will still be fruitful. They'll still be productive is what that means. They'll still be productive and they will still be anointed. Amen. So that means the anointing on my life is not going to diminish. The older I get, it's going to get stronger. It's going to go to another level. Hallelujah. Praise God. So you older people, you got something to look forward to. Amen. So stay in faith. 
Stay focused on the promises. Don't allow anything to distract you. And I'm telling you, your best days are not behind you. Your best days are just ahead of you. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a good shout. I think he deserves it. Amen. Amen. Now, we read Genesis 26. You thought I forgot. I have good memory. I started confessing that. The first time I heard Kenneth Hagin, I thought, dear Lord, how can he remember all those things? He would say things like, back in 1941 in McKinney, Texas, on a Tuesday at about three o'clock in the afternoon, I thought, how does he remember all that? And sometimes he'd say, you know, back in 1951 on uh, uh August the 12th, uh, that was a Thursday. You remember that? I say, how does he remember that? So I started confessing. I have a memory like Kenneth Hagin. In fact, I am the historian for Kenneth Copeland Ministries. They, they've got 500 people on staff over there and they don't know the history of that ministry. I was there. Brother Copeland was in the ministry two years when he and I got together. I was there from the beginning. I've seen all this growth. I've seen, I've been a part of all the things that have happened in his ministry. And every once in a while, uh, George Pearson has called me over so I can give a history lesson to the staff. I'm the historian. George will even say, Brother Jerry, uh, what was that sermon that Brother Copeland preached in Omaha in 1972 uh, that you refer to quite often? Uh, George, that was called uh, faith and patience, the power twins. How do you remember that? I've got a memory like Kenneth Hagin. <laughs> Not only that, but I found in the Bible, the memory of the upright is blessed. The memory of the upright is blessed. Amen. The only time I didn't have a memory is when I experienced that stroke, but God delivered me from it and gave me my memory back. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's look at Genesis chapter 26, talking about uh, there should be evidence when the blessing of God is on you. There should be signs of progress and advancement. And Genesis chapter 26, when Abimelech and his friends and the chief, uh, his chief captain saw what uh, God had done for Isaac, it says in verse 29, that thou will do us no hurt as we have not touched thee and as we have done unto thee nothing but good and have sent thee away in peace. And notice what they said, what they recognized. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. In other words, they knew that his father had the blessing of God on him. But now with what they've seen God do in his life, they're saying, now you are the blessed of the Lord. There was evidence of it. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm now the blessed of the Lord. And more and more evidence of it is coming my way. Amen. I am now the blessed of the Lord. And if I am now the blessed of the Lord, then you should be seeing progress and advancement. Amen. One of, one of the ways that, that I have progressed and advanced is just in uh, our aviation department. Just that one area alone. Because I started out with single engine airplanes, uh, twin engine airplanes, uh, then worked my way up to cabin class airplanes, uh, turbo props. And now I'm flying an international jet. Amen. I've gone from single engine airplanes to an international Falcon 50 that has three engines and can take me anywhere in the world. 42,000 feet, 500 miles an hour. Hallelujah, that I'll drag a Chevrolet. Praise God. Amen. I progressed. There's been advancement. Amen. And I've heard the Lord say to me recently, son, I'm not done yet. 
I'm not done yet. In fact, Richard did something for me, gave it to me yesterday. And now I'm carrying it in my Bible, Richard. That's a Falcon 900. Uh, my Falcon 50 from Fort Worth to Australia, I have to make four stops, two stops in this one. And Richard had a Falcon 50 printed up and underneath it, project completed. I carry that around now. I stuck it in my Bible, in my Bible case. And what I do when I'm believing for my next aircraft to help me visualize it and stay single-minded, I have a model of it put on my desk. And every time I come home, I, I lay my hands on that model and thank God for the next airplane that's coming into this ministry. And when the model, when the airplane that I have a model of manifest, I put that model in a cabinet. There's 10 model airplanes in that cabinet of airplanes that God had put in this ministry and debt free. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, there was a group of preachers that came to see me one time and they wanted to come up to my office and I showed them that cabinet. And I said, every airplane model in that cabinet, God brought it to pass in, these minist in this ministry. And there was a stealth in that cabinet. And one of them said, Brother Jerry, you've owned a stealth? We never seen it. I said, that's why they call it a stealth. <laughs> no, somebody just sent me a model of it. Praise God. I'm not believing for stealth yet. Okay. <laughs> no, this, this, one will, this one will do quite well. Thank you, Richard. It's a blessing to me. Praise God. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. So when you read it, you can run with it. It motivates you. Hallelujah. So notice once again, they saw the blessing with evidence on Isaac. When the blessing is on you, you cannot help but to advance. You cannot help but to progress. Can you say amen? amen. All right, now, I'll say this to you. Progressing, advancing is always God's will. Regressing, going backward is never his will. Progressing and advancing is always God's will. Regressing and going backwards in life is never the will of God. The only time you see God's people regressing and going backwards, and I'll give you the scripture for it. Go with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Are you receiving today? Isaiah chapter one and look at verse four. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. Now look at the latter part of this verse. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Now notice, when you forsake God, you forsake his word, you abandon your faith, backwards is where you're headed. You will regress. In other words, you are not, you're not going forward anymore. You're not progressing. And that's, that's the story of a lot of Christians today. I personally don't understand anybody that's ever heard the word of faith backing away from it. And I see it all the time. I see preachers backing away from it. Uh, I, I've said for years, I've told my staff many times, one of these days, the body of Christ is going to finally grow up and then they quit running to the guy that shouts the loudest, has a circus atmosphere in his meetings, comes on the scene, you know, with, with a blaze and then fizzles out. They're going to finally grow up one day and just look for those that have stability and they keep preaching the same thing over and over and God keeps blessing them. Amen. And when they start looking for people like that, they'll find us. Amen. 
They'll find us. Amen. And I've noticed more and more here lately. I've, I've noticed more and more. Some of the ministries that I used to go to, churches I used to go to back in the early days, that went a different direction. They called themselves Word of Faith churches, but then they had their ears tickled by something else that sounds good, but is not quite accurate. And they walked away from the faith or quit preaching the word of faith. You know, they start regressing. And I'm noticing more and more that some of those people that I used to go to that didn't have me anymore are now wanting me back. And one of them said, Brother Jerry, uh, uh, we, we, we dropped the word of faith and we suffered for it. Would you come back? Well, I'll go wherever God wants me to go. And some of them used to ask me to come and do uh, meetings like your uh, conference you have in February. Yeah, Word of His Power Conference. And you have a number of speakers. Yes, and I come. And uh, I, there was a lot of conferences like that that, that I would come to. <laughs> that I would come to and it'd be all word of faith speakers. And then eventually I'd come and I'd notice that they were having less and less word of faith speakers and they were having other speakers who publicly in their churches said the word of faith movement is over and would call my name, Kenneth Hagin's name and Kenneth Copeland's name, Fred Price and Charles Cap, publicly say that word of faith movement is over and I'm thinking, why does this man have this guy when he, he tries to destroy everything we preach? I get up and preach faith. He comes back and behind me and preach something else. He said, well, I'm trying to bring balance. I said, you're not bringing balance. You're bringing confusion. A little, a little faith and a little unbelief does not produce balance. Amen. Only thing that produces balance is truth. So I told one guy, I said, uh, well, it's evident you're walking away from the word of faith. You know what I stand for. You know what I preach. So don't invite me to come anymore because I'll ruin your party. So I didn't, I didn't go anymore. Ten years later, Brother Jerry, we've lost 50% of our people. We don't know why. I said, I do. <laughs> you started preaching something else Besides what brought you to where you were, you started out in the word of faith. God built your church on the word of faith and you backed away from it. Now your church is falling apart. Would you come back and help us? I said, well, before I do, why don't you send me some messages that you preached recently in your church? So he sent them to me, some cassettes. Remember cassettes? Send me some cassettes. So I, I listened to him. I knew right away why his church was dwindling. He wasn't preaching what built that church, the word of faith. Now, before I could respond to his invitation to come back, he was in a minister's conference and told the people, and one of my minister friends was in the service and he called me and told me what the man said. I said, would you send me a copy of the message if they recorded it before I address him? He said, sure. And so I heard him say it. He said, Jerry Savelle called me recently and he's confused about what to preach anymore. And he wanted to know what I preached. So I sent him some tapes. I called him. I said, you're a liar. You're a hypocrite. And no, I won't be coming back to your church. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Now, if I gave this man's name, another one, that, not this same one I just talked about. If I gave this man's name, most of you would know, recognize it, but I won't tell you who. We were invited to a conference in Africa, and I won't tell where, but normally I went there every year, preached to 10,000 people or more. Every year, 
Word of faith preachers, word of faith preachers, word of faith preachers, word of faith preachers. This one year, he invited a man who publicly denies and ridicules all of us who preach the word of faith. So I asked the man, I said, why have you invited this man? You know he doesn't preach what we preach and he doesn't preach what you built this ministry on. He said, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to win him over. Well, after that conference, it was obvious he was not winning the man over. The man won him over. And he quit preaching the word of faith. So I said, well, it's not likely I'll be coming back. If this is what you want, then I'm not going to be part of your adding confusion to your congregation. So if you ever decide to start preaching the word of faith again, call me. So eventually he did. And he had the same man back. I said, why are you doing this? He said, well, I'm still trying to win him over. I said, it's not working. He's winning you over. And I preached that night and the man was in the service and he got up while I'm preaching, walked up to the platform, got down on his knees and asked me to forgive him for criticizing the word of faith and criticizing me publicly and Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland and others that preach the word of faith got down on his knees in front of 10,000 people and apologized and asked me to forgive him. I laid my hands on him and said, I forgive you. And he said, I was wrong. He said, what I heard tonight, I don't, I cannot disagree with anything you said. And I was wrong and I'm asking you to forgive me. I said, no problem. I forgive you. He left Africa, went back to the U.S., went to a minister's conference and stood up the night he preached and a friend of mine recorded it or got the recording, sent it to me. And the man said, I was in a meeting with Jerry Savelle in Africa last week. And when Jerry Savelle preached the word of faith, the crowds went down. When I preached, the crowds went up. That just goes to show nobody wants to hear that word of faith message anymore. So I'm listening to the tape where he said this. Called my name out. On my desk was a letter that he had sent me as soon as he got home. He was, his, he was behind on the mortgage on his church and asking me to help him. So I picked up the phone and called him. I said, you're a hypocrite. You stood up in front of 10,000 people and apologized. And then go right back and in this minister's conference and, and say, nobody wants to hear that word of faith and then have the audacity to ask me to send an offering to help you with the, pay the mortgage on your church? I said, here's, 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 here's the answer, sir. You don't want my message, but you do want what it'll produce. I was in a meeting, me and Brother Copeland, in a meeting with about 2,000 preachers. And we were the only two that represented the word of faith. And I later found out they just had us there as a token so they could say, we even had some of the word of faith boys. And, and their budget was over the top. And one day I get a call in my room from the organizer of the meeting. And he said, Brother Savell, uh, we're struggling with the budget on this meeting. And uh, we are so far behind. We don't know how we're going to pay for all this. And we had a meeting today, an emergency meeting. And somebody said, uh, why don't you get one of the faith guys to receive the offering? And your name came up. Would you receive the offering tonight? I said, you don't want my message, but you want what it'll produce. Amen. My personal opinion, if you ever walk away from the word of faith, it was never truly a revelation to you to begin with. Because why would you walk away from something that has the potential of changing every aspect of your life? Are you still here? Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, aren't you glad you're still here in the word of faith? Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. The word of faith is designed by God 
to bring progression and advancement to your life. The, the, the blessing, now I'll, I'll close it with this. The blessing is designed by God to produce advancement and progression in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you can read all the blessings and you're familiar with them, but take the time to read them again. Verse 13 makes this statement. The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. Now that's what the blessing is capable of doing. Making you the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. Another translation says, you'll always be on top. You'll never be on bottom. I like that. You'll always be on top. That, that's, that's progression. That's advancement. You'll always be on top, never on bottom. So one of the meanings of this verse is that through the blessing, you will have dominion over your adversary. You will be superior to anything that he attempts to throw your way in an effort to rob you of what God has promised you. You will rise above what holds others down. You will increase in prosperity. You will increase in power. You will increase in dignity and others will be attracted to your life. Amen. You will always, one translation says, you will always go up and never down. That's progress. That's advancement. Amen. You will always be on top and never on bottom. Amen. So the only way that it's possible for you to regress and go backwards is to abandon God, abandon His Word, and abandon your faith. Well, why would anyone as smart as you want to do that? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Look at, your, look at your neighbor and say, and my mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> Hallelujah. You received that this morning? Yeah. Praise God. Let's all stand. Let's all stand and, and just give God praise for bringing us in. I will always be grateful. Always be grateful that God loved me so much that he sent word of faith men into my life when I didn't know anything. T.L. Osborne said to Kenneth Copeland one time, and he said it to me some years later. He said, you men are so blessed because you were born with no religion in you. I didn't have to unlearn religious tradition. When I came into this, this is all I've known for 54 years. Word of faith. That's all I know. And I'm not changing now. I don't care what's the most popular thing going on in the body of Christ. I'm sticking with this. I'm sticking with this. Hallelujah. The Bible says in the message translation that Abraham stuck it out and got everything God had promised to him. How many of you want everything God's promised to you? Then look at somebody and tell them, just stick it out. Just stick it out. Stay with the word. Stay with God. And you'll never go backwards. And you'll never regress. Let's give the Lord a good shout of praise for it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We worship you. We bless you. And we thank you for your word today. You've heard me say it many times in the past, Father, and I'll say it again today. Your word has made the difference in my life. Your word has made the difference in my life. And I pray in Jesus' name that the word that have, I've shared with this wonderful, gracious group of people will change and make a difference in their life. In Jesus' name. Lay your hands on somebody next to you. Pray this prayer over them. In Jesus' name, I pray that the word you've heard today will lodge in your heart and Satan will not be able to steal it from you. That it will produce as much as a hundredfold in your life. 
and cause you to progress and cause you to advance. And I pray that you will never regress, never go backwards. As long as you stay focused on the promises, as long as you stay in faith, as long as you refuse to be distracted, you will always progress. You will always advance and just get ready. Your highest expectations are about to be fulfilled. And give the Lord your best shout. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be seated for just a moment, please. Be seated for just a moment. I have the privilege of inviting you to sow your seed today. Now, let me, let me share with you something that I learned a long time ago. <clears throat> when God gave promise to Abraham, and you could refer to it as a prophetic word because it had not come to pass yet. When God said to Abraham, I will bless you. I will cause you to be a blessing. And then he said, and your wife, Sarah, will conceive and, and, and have a son. And from that seed will come mighty nations. Now that was all prophetic. Okay. And you know, in the natural, it was impossible for Sarah to have a child. Her womb was dead. She couldn't conceive. But the Bible says Abraham believed God. Now he did mess up at first, trying to figure out how God's going to do this. Sarah tried to figure out how he's going to do it. And one day, I guess while Abraham's out in the field somewhere, she came up with this brilliant idea. Now my handmaiden, she can conceive. And maybe the way God's going to give you that son is that you get with her and she can give you that son. I'm not able to. And the father of faith said, that's a wonderful idea. And he did, and she did, and they did. And Ishmael was born. And later, much later, you get over to the writings of the Apostle Paul, and Paul says, Ishmael was of the flesh, Isaac by promise. I call Isaac a result of leaning to the arm of the flesh. And if you study your Bible closely, after Isaac was born, God did not say another word to Abraham for 13 years. And when he finally spoke to him again in Genesis chapter 17, it opens with, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. It was not, it was not, uh, you know, in nice ooey gooey words. It was a rebuke. I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In other words, I don't need your help, Abraham. All I need is your faith. And the Bible says Abraham fell on his face before God. And from that moment, the apostle Paul picks up on it in Romans 4 and says, when Abraham was 90 and 9, something happened to him. That's what happened to him. God appeared to him when he was 99 years old and rebuked him for leaning to the arm of the flesh. When Abraham was 90, and Paul says nearly 100, Abraham no longer staggered at the promise of God. He was strong in faith, fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. That was not a description of Abraham at 75. It was a description of Abraham at 99. He learned his lesson. Okay? And, of course, Isaac was born. Now, before Isaac was born, Abraham's engaged in some warfare. And he took some of his household servants who had no training in warfare and defeated several kings and took the spoil. Okay? Now watch this. And he gave a tenth of the spoil to Melchizedek. 
Now, where did he learn that? You won't find anywhere prior to this in the Bible where God taught on tithing or anybody said anything about tithing. And that's what tithe is, a tenth. Abraham decided to do that. He did it as an act of his will. What was he doing? Now, this is what I learned from him. He was honoring God for his victory, but he was also sowing seed toward his future. He gave him a tenth of all. Why? Because what God had promised had not been fulfilled yet. So he was giving a tenth to God for what God had done in giving him that great victory, honoring God. And he's also giving a tenth for his future. Now that's where I learned when God gives me a prophetic word, the first thing I do is I sow a seed toward the fulfillment of it. I, I take my, my, my biggest seed, my best seed. I say, God, I'm sowing this, even though I haven't even seen this come to pass yet, but I'm, I'm acting, the Bible says in Romans 4, that we are to follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. So Lord, I'm bringing this offering to you, just like my father Abraham did, as seed toward the fulfillment of this word for my future. And that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. If, if, you're, if you need progress and you need to advance, and we all do in some way, then I've given you the prophetic word for it. Now, I encourage you to sow your best seed toward the fulfillment of it. Amen. And it's never failed. God has honored it for me all these years. How many of you want to progress and you want to advance and you want your highest expectation fulfilled? Then are you willing to sow a seed for it? Amen. So bow your heads for a moment. Let's pray. And you ask the Lord, what would be the best seed that you could do to sow toward the fulfillment of this prophetic word in your life? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I've shared the word with the people. And now I pray that they will be sensitive to your leadership in revealing to them what would be the best seed that they could sow toward the fulfillment of this prophetic word coming to pass in their life. And I believe they will hear you. Your word says, my sheep hear my voice. These are your sheep. So they hear your voice. And now I pray what they hear, they'll be obedient to. Your word says, if they obey and serve, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. So they will hear your voice. They will obey. And that'll be the seed that you will take to fulfill the prophetic word in their lives in 2024. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, ushers, are you ready? Are we going to bring it up? Okay, go ahead and stand as the praise and worship team ministers unto the Lord. Bring your best seed and get ready. Get ready to progress. Get ready to advance. And get ready for your highest expectations to be fulfilled.